Neighbors Romania, Ukraine and Moldova have all signed cooperation agreements with Romania's capital after a trilateral meeting on ways to strengthen security and their Black Sea region to counter threats posed by Russian aggression. The Black Sea Security Conference in Bucharest also brought together the three countries' foreign and defense ministers, government officials and international partners. Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba said that NATO should play a bigger role in security in the Black Sea and integrate Ukraine's air and missile defenses with those of Alliance allies. Black Sea is instrumental for making the whole of Europe peaceful and future-oriented. Sadly, Black Sea is also a showcase of how rapidly things can deteriorate if one neglects threats. We need to address the common Russia problem together. For instance, I support the expert idea to integrate the air and missile defense systems of Ukraine with the ones of the Black and Baltic Sea NATO allies. The upcoming NATO summit in Vilnius is the right time to correct mistakes of the past by taking resolute step forward on the path to Ukraine's NATO membership to show that the door is not only open, but there is a clear plan on when and how Ukraine will enter it. I assume we all understand now that fear is not a strategy. It is time to work out a comprehensive security network for all nations on, of the region that feel threatened by the maniac on the loose. It's time to turn Black Sea into what the Baltic Sea has become, a sea of NATO. Peace in full respect of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine, in full respect of the UN Charter and of the fundamental principles of international law. But negotiations can only start when Ukraine is ready and the victory will look like in the way Ukraine will define it. Just as the Republic of Moldova, for Romania at national level it is more than clear Romania is doing a lot to strengthen Black Sea security for NATO and EU members and as well as for our partners, be it Ukraine, the victim of Russia's aggression, or for, as I previously said, the Republic of Moldova and Georgia, who are, after Ukraine, the most vulnerable to Moscow's pressures. Meanwhile, Ukrainian Defense Minister Oleksiy Reznikov has said that Kiev needed guarantees that will make future Russian aggression impossible. He was speaking alongside NATO Deputy Secretary General Mitya Giona at the close of the Black Sea Forum. The Black Sea and its Ukrainian coast have been crucial theaters of war since Russia's invasion of Ukraine last year. Both Moscow and Kiev rely on the sea for trade, including supplying grain markets as two of the world's biggest food exporters. The Russian blockade threatened to cause a global food crisis last year until the United Nations and Turkey brokered an agreement to keep ports open and still the focus of diplomacy. We need a system of guarantees that would make aggressor from Russia impossible. It presents there are no alternative to the NATO formula. Three countries of the region are already NATO members. There is no alternative to Ukraine's accession to NATO. The Allies' security infrastructure needs to be scaled up to the east. Ukraine has already proven its interoperability. Ukraine has already made its move by formally applying to join NATO. No progress towards this goal just extends the period of uncertainty and risks. Russia's irresponsible and hostile behavior in the broader Black Sea region is deeply affecting the security of the entire alliance. So and in Madrid, last year, when our leaders approved a strategic concept saying the strategic importance of the Black Sea, this is not just a piece of paper. This is a fundamental belief and action by our alliance. We stepped up our presence in the region since 2014. We enhanced our cooperation partnership with Ukraine. And this is why our footprint after the full-blown war by Russia is increasing. We have increased our support to other partners at risk of Russian aggression, including for the Republic of Moldova. Recently, NATO and the EU, our Secretary General and President von der Leyen, would establish a joint task force on critical infrastructure. And I encourage the countries in the Black Sea region to 
co-opt and be active in this new format because of the Black Sea as critical infrastructures we need to protect, defend and make sure that they work to the benefit of all people. And as for the Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov, he said the Black Sea will never be a NATO sea until Ukraine's foreign minister asks the Atlantic Alliance to play a bigger security role in the region. Both Russia and Ukraine have a Black Sea coastline, as do NATO members Turkey, Bulgaria and Romania. NATO and demilitarization are mutually exclusive concepts. The Black Sea will never be a NATO sea. It is a common sea for all coastal states. It should be a sea of cooperation, interaction and security. Russia's defense ministry says that the Wagner missionary forces were pressing on with high-intensity combat operations to push Ukrainian forces out of the central quarters of the embattled Ukrainian city of Bakhmut. The Russian defense ministry spokesperson Igor Konashekov stated that Russian airborne troops, tactical aviation, missile troops and artillery also took part in the offensive, blocking the transfer of Ukrainian reserves to the city and preventing them from retreating from the city. On the Donetsk axis, Wagner assault detachments continued high-intensity combat operations to oust the enemy from the central quarters of the city of Artyomovsk, which is the Soviet name for Bakhmut. The airborne troops provide support to the assault detachments on the flanks, blocking the transfer of Ukrainian reserves to the city and the possibility of enemy units retreating from Artyomovsk. The strikes of operational tactical aviation, missile troops and artillery fire of the southern group of troops hit accumulations of manpower and equipment of the armed forces of Ukraine in the areas of settlements, in the areas of the settlements of Kalinivka, Mykolaivka and Stopochki of the self-proclaimed Donetsk People's Republic. Over the past 24 hours, to back up troops in the Artyomovsk region, Russian Aerospace Forces aircraft made 12 sorties, while group missile troops and artillery completed 57 fire missions. The total losses of the enemy on the Donetsk axis in 24 hours amounted to 300 Ukrainian servicemen, one infantry fighting vehicle, six armored combat vehicles, two vehicles, a D-20 howitzer, and a Vostika self-propelled artillery mount. Footage released by NATO shows that Ukrainian tank operators driving Leopard tanks during the 30-day training on their vehicles to be used to fight Russia's invasion. The tanks have been seen driving and firing their main guns, as well as Ukrainians using stimulators at the Leopard Training Center in Poland. Captain Stefan Nois, the deputy commander of the center, says that Ukrainians taking the course were eager to learn everything they could about the vehicles despite the 12-hour days. While Canadian Army Captain Brittany Shkazes said the similar training usually took three months and was definitely very condensed, but resembled a conversion course as the Ukrainians were already experienced with the Soviet T-series tanks. So first start out with the theory in the classrooms, then we go for the simulators with the basics like starting up the engine, some basic maneuvers, and then we proceed on to real tank, training on the tactical strip and introducing some tactics and how to act during the live firing exercises and such. Even though the training is 12 hours a day, uh, even at the end of the day, they still want to learn more get some more experience, work a bit more around the tank, they have questions all the time because the, the stakes for them are very high. They want to know as much as they can once they get back to Ukraine. We have 30 days to do this course and uh, typically this course runs for about three months in Canada, uh, so it's definitely very condensed. However, um, the Ukrainians that are here have come from tank platforms already, the T-series tanks, so um, they already come with that knowledge of gunnery, knowledge of uh, mechanical systems, so it really ends up being more of a conversion course, um, just not necessarily teaching them how to be tankers, but teaching them how to use this particular tank. So the Leopard tank brings a lot more um, 
accuracy than the T-Series tanks. It brings a lot more distance in which it can engage, uh, a lot more speed moving uh, both forward and backwards. For example, if you compare the um, T-Series tanks, they go about 5 kilometers per hour backwards, whereas the Leopard can reach 30, 40 kilometers going backwards easily. So it's definitely a more advanced system, and um, it brings a lot more uh, benefits to the battlefield for the Ukrainian side. The International Monetary Fund, the IMF, has projected that China is going to contribute about one-third of the global growth this year. IMF chief Kristalina Georgieva called on countries to take strong policy actions to promote global economic recovery. She also said the global economy is at a highly uncertain moment. The inflation, the Ukraine crisis and the recent pressure from the international financial market have all taken a heavy toll on global economy's recovery and its financial stability. We see uh, China this uh, year uh, rebouncing uh, uh, quite strongly. Our projection is for 5.2% growth. We have uh, been uh, uh, pleased to see this rebound of uh, China. Uh, China this year is going to contribute about one-third of global growth. German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock has asked Beijing to ask the Russian aggressor to stop the war in Ukraine, adding that no other country has more influence on Russia than China. Ms. Baerbock spoke after a meeting with her Chinese counterpart, Queen Gang, in Beijing. The German minister's visit to Beijing is coming just one week after French President Emmanuel Macron and the head of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, all asked J Beijing to play a more significant role in ending the conflict. After that meeting, China announced that Defense Minister Li Shangfu will be on a four-day visit to Russia from Sunday at the invitation of his counterpart, Sergei Shoigu. And the spokesperson for jailed Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny has said that he is grappling with a series of st severe stomach pain in jail that could be some sort of slow acting poison. Kiria Yarmish said that an ambulance was called for Navalny at the maximum security IK6 panel penal colony at Melekovo, and that's about 250 kilometers east of Moscow, where he has been held. She says that Navalny was suffering from severe stomach pain and could not eat the prison food provided to him because it was making his pain worse, and since Monday has been banned from buying alternative food. She also adds that there is no definitive proof of the poisoning theory, but that he had never had such pains before. His lawyer uh, told us uh, that um, there was an ambulance call for Alexei uh, on Friday uh, because of severe stomach pain um, he had, uh, which is uh, a huge surprise for us, uh, to put it mildly, because Alexei um, has never experienced anything like this before. He, he is now in a punishment cell uh, since, well, during his last stay in the punishment cell uh, during the last 15 days. He lost 8 kilos uh, of weight. Um, he Actually, he doesn't eat anything because um, he is prohibited to receive parcels with food or to buy food in prison store. There is no answer to it. This is just uh, a way of pressure they put on him. I mean, there is no legal basis uh, to uh, prohibits such thing uh, for any inmate in Russia. But they just decided that this, this will be another restriction that they will imply on him. On Monday, they also, for example, reduced um, the time uh, which he has for writing letters, like for correspondence. Before, it was 35 minutes a day, and now even less. So, uh, I mean, this is what they do. We can't rule out the idea that uh, he is being poisoned uh, even now, but not uh, in huge uh, dosage as before.
uh, but in small ones so that he not for him not to die immediately but to suffer and to ruin, uh, ruin his health um, steadily uh, but well but still uh, so well we don't we don't have any proof of this but um, as I told you before uh, he has never experienced um, any pains like this uh, I am actually terrified uh, because no one knows what is happening uh, everyone is very concerned and we just know that uh, well we definitely understand that this is not an uh, idea of prison administration. It is an order uh, that comes from above. Uh, I am completely sure that it is Putin uh, who decides what will happen with Alexei. So uh, the thing is that Putin doesn't have any red lines that he wouldn't cross. We know it for sure. Uh, we know that he already tried to kill Alexei. So nothing can stop him to try again, uh, just maybe slowly. The United Nations spokesman Stefan Dujeric has said he hopes that Navalny will be giving the medical treatments that he is entitled to. Navalny, who is serving combined sentences of 11 and a half years for fraud and contempt of court and charges, he says, were trumped up to silence him said via Twitter on Tuesday that he had been moved back into solitary confinement and forced to endure extremely hellish conditions. Alexei Navalny has got severe stomach pain. His spokeswoman says he may be um, reacting to some sort of slow-acting poison. Does, does the Secretary General or the Office of Human Rights have any reaction? I mean, reaction? We, I, I don't have any more details, just to say we, we, we very much hope he will given, be given the medical treatment uh, that he is entitled to. Polish paramedic Robert said that he had no doubt that he had to come to Ukraine when Russia started a full-scale invasion in February last year. The 42-year-old, who did not give his last name, works for Poland-based Hamanosh Foundation, a non-governmental organization providing medical services in Ukraine since last spring. Part of a bigger team, which includes six doctors and a nurse, Robert came on Thursday on the frontline town of Orykiv in the southeastern Zaporozhye region. Local volunteer Mikola also said the only hospital in the town was destroyed in the first days of the Russian invasion, and he said he offered the services of Polish doctors to provide local residents with the much needed medical care. Well, let's bring in VOA's Anna Chernikova, who joins me now from Kiev to discuss more on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Thank you very much for joining us again, as always, Anna. Good evening. Uh, let's begin with uh, the role that Germany as, is playing as a mediator. I mean, now they're already asking uh, China to pressure Russia to end the war in Ukraine. Um, well, we can see that uh, in this past uh, weeks, um, a lot of uh, well, various, let's put it this way, various uh, international leaders uh, had meetings with uh, Chinese leadership and uh, uh, also um, President Zelensky is still, uh, is still planning and hoping, I guess, to uh, have a talk, conversation with the Chinese leader. Uh, of course, um, everyone got this understanding that China has a special influence and special relationship with Russia, and we can also see it uh, using the fact that uh, Chinese leader is the only leader, except of, uh, let's say, Belarus, uh, President Lukashenko, uh, who was uh, visiting uh, Putin, who is visiting Putin uh, constantly. So he was the only international leader coming to Russia to meet Putin. And, um, uh, of course, uh, international community has this hope that actually China can take a side and uh, can try to influence Russian decisions or Russian uh, leadership uh, uh, plans. Uh, but this is one side of the coin. Another side of the coin, as we can see, and also what we can see from, uh, from the official statements by China, um, that um, there is not yet, uh, I guess, uh, you know, this uh, 
let's say, neutral uh, status of, of Chinese leadership and uh, uh, complete understanding of both sides. Uh, as the, I already mentioned, President Zelensky is still waiting for uh, the meeting, uh, for the possible meeting with, uh, with the leadership of China. So at least to get this, you know, role of uh, mediator or role of uh, someone who can actually influence this war uh, and uh, this future um, ending of war. Uh, at least Chinese leadership will have to meet Ukrainian leadership, not only Russian leadership. So uh, for the moment, we can see that uh, international community has certain uh, position regard and certain understanding and probably knowledge as well regarding Chinese-Russian relationship. And that's why they uh, kind of see possibility here for China to influence Russia. But again, uh, it's important to understand what is what is Chinese uh, uh, opinion and Chinese position on this war, because for the moment we haven't really uh, heard or uh, seen any particular, you know, statements uh, which would have been uh, kind of, you know, decisive that, OK, this is the position of China. So we just see that China is trying to, you know, um, continue its own business, doing its own business using Russia as well, uh, and not only Russia. Uh, and of course, uh, again, the, uh, with this uh, latest uh, documents leak, um, we also hear and see certain information about possible um, Chinese um, military assistance to Russia. Again, this is not confirmed, this is not verified yet, but uh, and we cannot independently uh, verify it for the moment, but uh, definitely it should be, you know, it should be very clear what Chinese position is in this war. Exactly, uh, Anna. I mean, we know that the last time the Chinese president visited a Russia president, he didn't say anything significant about brokering peace or keeping peace in Ukraine. Do you think with all the drama, especially with China, Taiwan, and all of this happening at the same time, is China in the best position to broker peace between Russia and Ukraine? Uh, to be honest, for the moment, there are no signs of that. Uh, at least, again, coming back to the, to, to the statement that China has never, Chinese leadership has never, uh, ha had never had any conversation with Ukrainian leadership, because this, is, this would have been crucial to start even talk about any possible role in this, you know, negotiations or future negotiations and so on and so forth. And second point, uh, we never heard any direct and clear statements by Chinese leadership in terms of this war. So for the moment, but again, this is on the public uh, surface. Uh, we don't know what's happening behind the scenes. And maybe, maybe we can, of course, uh, imagine that uh, certain conversations might be happening. But again, according to Ukrainian officials, no communication with Chinese officials uh, have, with Chinese leadership, let's put it this way, to, to, top leadership has been done between Ukrainian and Chinese uh, leadership. So, um, again, we will have to wait until uh, this, uh, until the leaders of two countries uh, are in touch, because for the moment, this is really uh, early stage to say that China can actually uh, change something sig significantly. And it doesn't appear that uh, Russia is quitting on Bakhmut. I mean, Russia has said the Wagner fighters are already pressing on with high combat operations, thereby ousting the Ukrainian troops from central Bakhmut. What is your position on this? What we're hearing from, uh, even from the Ukrainian officials, that actually Russian forces are increasing their pressure there. So uh, it's definitely that they do not give up. And um, it's... It's not logical for them at this point to give up because it's already too long way have been, you know, uh, went um, and too, too, too deep they are in the city. So, um, and Ukrainian officials again confirm that uh, they had uh, Ukrainian force, um, sorry, Russian forces had certain advances recently, particularly Wagner Group. Uh, and um, at the same time, uh, we also um, see the reports from the Institute for the Study of War and International Intelligence is that um, actually uh, Russian forces 
are moving to either towards the central part or even they already reached the central part. But uh, what we know for, officially from the Ukrainian authorities that Ukrainians uh, keep certain positions and keep certain uh, defense lines. Uh, but the uh, situation is definitely getting worse for Ukrainian forces and getting much more difficult for Ukrainian soldiers to uh, keep these lines in this position. So uh, for the moment, how it looks from here, from Ukraine, that uh, Russian forces will continue to press and to try to uh, take full control of the city as they are trying to do now for, for seven months, if I'm not mistaken now, so for a couple of months uh, in a row. Uh, and um, Ukrainian, uh, the task of the Ukrainian forces, and this is what Ukrainian military um, is, uh, is, stated, is stating, and uh, it's, not, it's not a secret that Ukrainian forces will try to prolong this period and to keep their positions and keep the defense for as long as it, it's possible. But again, as President Zelensky mentioned, uh, uh, until it's common sense in terms of uh, people, uh, people's lives and soldiers, uh, soldiers' lives particularly. All right. Thank you very much, VOA's Anna Chernikova, for your time and contribution as always on The World Today. Thank you.